It's been emphasized by now many times, I think, that huge sample sizes are required to actually conduct well-powered GWAS. And so how do you do that? Because uh, you cannot do that with using one sample usually. So you pull uh, data from different sources. The problem with that is that uh, data owners are unlikely to give you access to their raw data because of uh, privacy concerns. So what you do is uh, you ask them, ask the cohort analysts to run the GWAS for you and then they upload the GWAS summary statistics to a central server and then you meta-analyze them. So this is how it works. Uh, you first uh, design an analysis plan uh, specifying everything like the model, phenotype definition, covariates, uh, the imputation panel, uh, the output format and, and other things. And you, well, the best practice is, of course, you uh, pre-register that analysis plan so that uh, you don't change things uh, later on, depending on the results. S and then you distribute this analysis plan to the cohorts. And then the cohorts, cohort analysts uh, run the GWAS uh, based on that analysis plan. They upload the results to a central server. <laughs> and then uh, you meta-analyze the results. So what could go wrong with this? Anything that could go wrong with this? Obviously, this could happen. And it does happen, usually. Many, many <laughs> it does. <laughs> so what you need to add to this workflow is the quality control. What does quality control mean uh, in this context? So you inspect the results that the cohorts upload and make sure that uh, everything is sensible. Is it important? Yes, it's very important because, well, if you just add noise to your sample or worse, if you add reverse signal to your sample, adding more samples will not really uh, help you that much. So you have to make sure that your res the results that you're meta-analyzing are actually sensible results. Something, uh, well, if you don't do uh, stringent QC, things like this can happen. So th then they reminded me of this paper. It was published in Science in 2010. And they had to retract the paper later on because uh, they, well, what exactly uh, went? So what happened, so this was a study, this was GWAS of exceptional uh, uh, lifespan. I think they had a bunch of cases. They were centenarians, they had a bunch of controls. In the case, the controls were genotyped using different um, technologies. Um, and, um, and so that's a, that's a research design that's especially sensitive to sort of biases of the sort that Patrick describes. So suppose, for example, that from one of the arrays, um, you, have, you have some systematic bias that elevates the, 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 the measured allele frequency relative to cases. Um, if you don't adjust for that, then we compare the allele frequencies in cases and controls, if you haven't thrown out the bad SNPs, you're going to get a lot of, lot of spurious um, results. And that's what ended up happening, I should say. There's no, there was no impropriety or anything. It was just bad, bad QC in this uh, particular paper. And they went on to publish a, a cleaned up version of it um, you know, that reported some real and interesting findings. So yeah, if you don't want this to happen, you have to do really good QC. And so what can go wrong with the cohort level results? There are a lot of things that can go wrong. If you can think of it, it will go wrong in, in one cohort at least. So one of them is the incorrect coding of the phenotype. Uh, it could be that the missing values are wrongly uh, coded or it could be that the phenotype is reverse coded, for example. This happened uh, many times in the <laughs> subject of well-being GWAS. So for example, we, we wanted the cohorts to code the phenotype so that higher uh, numbers mean more happiness. Uh, so even though that was in the analysis plan and even though we checked uh, many times with the cohorts, uh, there were still some cohorts that reverse coded the phenotype, which would basically introduce reverse signal and that's the worst thing that can happen. <laughs> the model could have been uh, specified wrongly, so they, it's possible that they didn't include some of the necessary covariates. Um, this could be PCs which would uh, introduce population stratification. There, there can be problems with the genotype data or the imputation. So the, the alleles could be flipped. They could be uh, reporting the, uh, the effect for the wrong allele. 
or there could have been other uh, errors during imputation. You also want to, yeah. Yeah, we're going to come to that in a little bit. Uh, and, you, and you also want to drop unreliable SNPs. So what is an unreliable SNP? Uh, it could be <coughs> SNPs with very low minor allele frequencies for which uh, the models actually cannot be estimated that reliably. Uh, it could be SNPs with low imputation quality, where there's a lot of uncertainty for the genotype at that SNP. And how do we detect these problems? Okay, first of all, this is probably not very, uh, you can't see that, right? Okay, so uh, you ask for a number of uh, variables from the cohorts. Uh, this, these usually include the SNP IDs, uh, the effect allele, the other allele, p-values, betas, uh, standard errors, imputation accuracy, whether a SNP is imputed or not, and it, there could be other things, but we, this is usually what we ask for. And if, as you realize probably that there are some redun redundancies here, like we ask for the beta, the standard error, but also the p-value. So that also uh, is useful because you can actually uh, check the consistency between uh, those variables. You can get the p-value, for, for example, from the beta and SE, and then uh, you can check whether those p-values are actually similar to or identical to the p-values that are reported in the results. So before uh, starting the quality control as a first step, uh, you need to make sure that all the variables that you asked for are actually in there. Um, well, a lot of times it's usually not the case. So people forget to upload imputation accuracy or some other variables, for example. So you have to check for that before you start the QC. And you want to make sure that the files are uh, in the correct format, in the correct delimiters, for example. And, and you also need to make sure that all the descriptive statistics have been provided. Uh, this could be phenotype distribution, the, which genotyping chip has been used by the cohort, which imputation software has been used, because these are also, um, these affect the, the other steps uh, that you're going to conduct for the QC. So you, you need this input for some of the steps. First step then is the SNP filtering. So you could do this using uh, EasyQC, which is a nice R package for uh, SNP filtering uh, by Winkler et al. And you want to drop SNPs that are of low quality. So you want to drop SNPs that have, for example, uh, missing or incorrect values for um, the requested variables. <coughs> and this could be that, for example, the effect allele is not provided or the p-value is outside of the 0, 1 range. You want to drop SNPs with low minor allele frequency. Uh, so this threshold could, of course, uh, depend on your, on your choice, on how rare, uh, how low you want to go <coughs> on the uh, minor allele frequency spectrum. And you want to drop SNPs with low imputation accuracy. Yeah. You pick these uh, thresholds beforehand, and then you apply it to all the cohorts. So you don't want any SNPs from any cohort that has lower minor allele frequency than 1%, for example. But, or if, <coughs> but if the SNP has a uh, very low minor allele frequency in one cohort, but not in another cohort, would I drop that SNP for both cohorts? No. So it's co it would be cohort specific. Because you don't, you don't want, so for very rare SNPs, the models cannot be really be estimated. And if the sample size is very small, for example, in a cohort, um, <coughs> the minor, can I have water? How would, how would I, then wouldn't I have a data set that has SNPs that appear in some cohorts but not others? So you will have slightly, a slightly differing set of SNPs uh, in each cohort. And then uh, when you meta-analyze them, uh, a SNP does not necessarily have to be in all the cohorts. Okay. But you usually uh, also apply a sample size filter uh, to the meta-analysis results. So if, if a SNP is only available in 10,000 individuals out of 100,000, for example, you drop that I see. later on. Just blow up the standard errors. Yeah. <coughs> 
So yeah, you drop SNPs with low imputation accuracy. Uh, this could also, your threshold could can depend on the imputation software because different imputation softwares uh, report different kinds of, different measures of imputation accuracy. And you drop the variants that are outside of the scope of your meta-analysis. So if you, want, if you don't want to analyze structural variants, for example, you drop, drop those variants from each cohort. Then uh, you inspect how many SNPs are dropped uh, in each step for each cohort. So if, if there's too, too many SNPs that are dropped from uh, one cohort because of imputation accuracy, for example, um, you, th that could indicate a problem. <coughs> it could even be that uh, something else is reported, for example, instead of imputation accuracy. So if, you, if you're dropping like half of your SNPs in that step, uh, you have to realize that and look into it, basically. Sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, what's the sort of threshold? Do you have like a percentage to say that if it's about, if you're dropping about this much, then you know there's a problem with this cohort? Well, there are no such uh, thresholds, but so you do this to all your cohorts yeah. and then you, if I'm dropping one million SNPs in all cohorts, but like five million sure. in another one, it usually indicates something. So then, uh, after you're done with the SNP filtering, it's, you're still not all done. There could still be problems remaining in your data. To, uh, to understand what could have been the problem in the, in the remaining uh, data, you inspect diagnostic plots. So some useful plots to start with, these are all implemented in EasyQC, are allele frequency plots. I'm going to uh, go over this in the next slide. P-value versus Z-score plots, QQ plots, standard error versus sample size plots. And uh, you could also supplement these plots with other plots that you can think of that would uh, be indicative of problems. So this, these are examples of allele frequency plots. Here you plot your effect allele frequencies against a, a reference sample allele frequencies. So these are, um, so on, on the y-axis we have the effect allele frequency reported in the results and the x-axis is the effect allele frequencies from the 1000 Genomes European sample. So the leftmost plot is what it's supposed to look like. There will of course be outliers but there's no systematic problem in, the, in this plot. What are the ba what's that white band in the middle? Oh, that's, uh, so it's just not plotting if, it, if the difference from the reference sample allele frequency <laughs> uh, is less than a certain, it's 0.2, I think. So just to, um, for com computational ease, basically. <coughs> in the plot, in the middle is a problematic plot. So you see there's a band in the off diagonal so that, is usual, that happens usually when there's an imputation problem. If, for example, uh, prior to imputation, not all SNPs have been aligned to the correct strand, this could happen. Um, if you don't drop uh, strand ambiguous SNPs uh, prior to imputation, it could happen. So strand ambiguous SNP is, if you have a SNP that can take the alleles A and T, for example, uh, you cannot distinguish whether it's on the plus strand or the uh, minus strand because uh, it's ATTA. So, and if the, if the allele frequency is close to 0.5, there's no way to un detect that. So you have to drop those SNPs prior to imputation. And if you don't, uh, things like that could happen. And the plot on the right is how it can go completely wrong. <laughs> so that actually happened. I mean, these are all real <laughs> plots from real data. <laughs> So there, they are uh, reporting something else instead of effect allele frequency, basically. Yeah. Effect allele frequency, frequency is the so reference, same thing. Yeah. It's what we've been calling the reference allele frequency. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the frequency uh, of the allele for which you you're reporting the effect. So these are PZ plots. Here uh, you obtain the um, p-values from the reported beta and standard errors. 
and plot them against the reported p-values in the data. Uh, it should be all on the uh, 45 degree line, of course, but the, the plot on the right can also, so this is actually also a real plot. Uh, so this can happen. This ha usually happens when, um, so I think it was in, in SNP test, um, if you, for example, estimate a model using the score option, I think it was, uh, if the SNP is rare of the, or if the imputation accuracy for the SNP is very low, it could sometimes, it can default to another algorithm uh, and those p-values don't correspond exactly to your uh, p-values that, that you can get from the beta and the standard errors. So the standard errors go haywire basically. And <coughs> you can detect that using these plots. QQ plots. So the, again, the, the one on the left is what it's supposed to look like. The one on the right is not necessarily problematic if you have a very large sample size, because then, uh, because of true signal, uh, there's gonna be an early lift off from the 45 degree line. But if, for example, this, is, this comes from a, a cohort with a sample size of, I don't know, a, a thousand, for example, it, it shouldn't actually be lifting off that, that early from the 45 degree line. So there, that is usually indicative of some confounding problem, usually population stratification. And if you see that, you, have, you should be worried, basically. These are predicted versus reported standard error plots. So this, this is David's invention. <laughs> you, so on the, on the x-axis, you have the predict, predicted standard error. You can calculate this. This is an approximation, basically, but you can calculate the um, approximate standard error using the minor real frequency and the sample size. And it should be similar to the estimated standard errors that are reported in the results. It's, it, it won't be exactly the same because, well, it's an approximation and there are going to be factors that uh, make it a little bit different from the predicted standard error. But if you, for example, see, right, uh, like on the uh, plot on the right, if you see a systematic difference from the predicted standard error, it's usually also indicative of a problem. It could be that the sample size is reported wrongly. It could be a problem with the minor relief frequencies. Um, it could indicate um, that the missing values are coded wrongly. What else? What's the difference between the green and the red line? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the green line is um, assuming that the phenotype is standardized. And the red line is uh, assuming that uh, the standard deviation of the phenotype is equal to what they reported in the descriptive statistics. So this is, for example, uh, a reason why you want all the descriptive statistics complete um, with the results, so that you can actually calculate things like this. And so yeah. what are you checking for then? You, you check the this, line? you're checking, so with the red line, um, the red line basically is the 45 degree line, uh, assuming that the standard deviation is equal to the standard deviation reported in the um, descriptives. So you're checking whether the standard deviation reported in the descriptives is correct, or whether the, also the, whether the standard errors are more or less uh, equal to what you, you would expect given the standard deviation of the phenotype and the sample size. So if you have an analysis plan, we ask them to run the unstandardized use the unstandardized variable in the association analysis, these points should fall <coughs> in the red line. And sometimes they, but they'll just standardize without telling you, or they'll analyze a variable with variance of one, and then you would see a cluster of blue points on the green line instead. I mean, that's good to know because the scaling is different. It could also be that uh, there's not a systematic difference, but there are some outlier SNPs. In that case, uh, you want to look into what those SNPs are, what's wrong with them. You could do that, for example, with these plots. So this is a chromosome uh, standard error plot. So you basically uh, plot the standard errors per chromosome. So each of these plots are a chromosome. And the x-axis is the base pair position on the chromosome. So here, for example, you can see um, 
okay, anyway, here on the, here for example, uh, you can see some SNPs uh, that have higher than predicted standard errors on a specific region. So that could be because of an imputation problem, for example. Step three, so after inspecting all these plots, um, you can run some other additional diagnostics. You can test for allele misalignment or reverse coded phenotypes, for example. These both would have the, um, I mean, you can test using the same uh, methods for both of these because it's, well, it's the same, it has this, it, it leads to the same outcome, basically. This is what you ask for, I think, right? So if the cohort, for example, um, reported the effect, the beta for the wrong allele, rather than what they specified in the results, or if they coded the phenotype uh, wrongly, uh, you could check that uh, by checking the sign concordance uh, of the SNPs with another cohort. So if you take, for example, one of your uh, large sample size cohorts, and if you take the top SNPs from that cohort, uh, take a random 50,000 SNPs, for example, uh, you and check the sign concordance of uh, those SNPs with the other cohorts that you want to test, it should be, I mean, if it's uh, much less than expected, there's probably something wrong in there. Or another thing that you can do is um, check the genetic correlations between <coughs> cohorts. So you can do this using bivariatal least square regression, which I think Raymond is going to talk about tomorrow. Um, you can estimate the genetic correlation between uh, a large cohort again and the cohort that you want to look into. And if it's negative, for example, it's usually, it indicates either the phenotype is coded reversely or the wrong allele is uh, reported as the effect allele. The problem with this is uh, that, well, you cannot do this with small cohorts because it can, the genetic correlations cannot be estimated. But if you can, if it can be estimated, it's a good way to see whether um, s whether one of these problems are in your data. So this again happens with uh, the subjective well-being data. Um, it's useful, of course, to have. I mean, there we had multiple phenotypes: uh, life satisfaction and sub uh, and positive affect, for example. So from the same cohort, if you e estimate the genetic correlation between those phenotypes, you need you should have something positive. And well, it, it doesn't have to be uh, really large or, I mean, it's just suggestive evidence, of course. But if you have a negative uh, genetic correlation, you can assume that something, you know, one of the phenotypes has been coded reversely. How to fix these problems? So it could be that in all of your cohorts, for, for example, you're getting uh, slightly inflated um, deflated p-values or slight inflation in your QQ plots. In that case, so that could happen if, um, that could happen due to the rare SNPs or also um, SNPs that are imputed badly. In that case, if you have a systematic evidence in all cohorts of that, you want to increase your um, imputation accuracy threshold, for example. Or you want to, uh, you want to have a a uh, stricter minor allele frequency threshold. So if you do that, and if uh, some of the cohorts still uh, look problematic, um, for example, if, if that there's that uh, off diagonal in the allele frequency plot, uh, you contact the cohort analyst, you tell them what you suspect is the problem, and you want them to look into it. And if it's if they can figure out what the problem is, they rerun, re-upload, and you run, do all those steps again um, until there's, there are no more problems. It could be that uh, the imputation is faulty. In that case, um, usually they're not able to impute again on time uh, to make your deadline. So if the problem cannot be fixed, you have to drop the cohort from the meta-analysis. So we have, uh, if you want to read in more detail about all these steps, uh, you could look into the Winkler et al. paper, which is the EasyQC uh, paper. 
or uh, the supplements of the educational attainment and subject to well-being papers. And that is all about QC. Are there any more questions about QC? Yeah. Just wondering, like, I'm, I'm sure, like, even after you do all these steps, there would be like some things that you can't really control for. Like things like what happens if they omit sex as a covariate or, or you know, one of the access rules. Can you, is there any way you can sort of get a handle on these things? You can omit things sex. Yeah. X chrome, yeah. Right. But you can't uh, correct the, the coefficient. The like, you. <coughs> uh, so there's no question that there are going to be some subtle errors that, that yeah. are left. Your best intention has just slipped through. Um, yeah. And the one, yeah, in, in the example you gave, I think it would be very hard to detect. For the sort of genotypes we study, I think it would be very hard to detect that they've forgotten sex as a control. Sure. Now, if you're doing something like a GWAS of height, yeah. and you told people to make the dependent variable just height in centimeters to control for sex, then you would detect this in the standard error plots because sex explains so much of the variance in height. Yeah. You would end up seeing standard errors that were higher than what you would expect. Um, but, but but there's no guarantee that you're always going to pick, pick that up. We suspect, based on our own experience with all of the problems that come <coughs> up, that, that there are probably many published GWAS studies that have QC problems that survive into the final result. And, and one reason why we, I mean, besides the fact that it's really hard to find all these problems, and the reason we suspect it is you can do calculations of how many, you know, how much predictive power you expect from a polygen explorer at a given sample size, say, or the, you know, how many hits you think somebody's going to get. And oftentimes, the published papers have fewer hits or less predictive power than, than you, you would calculate. Um, and, you know, and that could be for various reasons, but, but it, we suspect it probably partly because of incomplete QC. Yeah. So here, it's, you make it sound like you convince uh, whatever technician there to, to run the analysis for you. But it seems like you do have code folks. You, why wouldn't it be like easier to kind of like provide them with the code to say like, look, here is what you need to run, and hopefully so besides pushing enter and changing the name of the file or something like this, and they don't have, they don't touch more because especially like I guess that the problem is like if they don't include one of the controls, then you that's going to be very hard to figure out how it affected the data or not. Right? You could do that, and I think that's the optimal way to go about it. But one problem is that so th all these cohorts use, of course, different software for imputation, for example, and their data is in different formats. And if you have imputed using impute, uh, you do the GWAS using SNP test, or if you have imputed using MUC, you do MUC to QTL, for example. So it's hard to convince the cohorts to use the exact software that you want them to use and convert all their da data to the proper formats and so on. So that, um, well, that kind of gets problematic sometimes. Uh, yeah? No, no, finish. I just want to add something. Um, but in principle, yeah, you can do it. And uh, if, you, if you can convince everyone, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that's often a good idea. But, but even there, there are potential problems because in each of these cohorts there are going to be specific circumstances that you need to deal with. Mm -hmm. But maybe that some cohorts are family based and through a process of trial and error they found that the most effective way to control for stratification is to use a specific particular association model. There and could be it's not always a good idea for yeah. us to tell them, oh you should be doing this instead. There could be additional covariates that they have to include. For example, batch for batch effects or for additional circumstances specific in to that country, for example. The change in their educational system. Yeah, things like that. Before and after. We tell so them, look at, you know, do that if it's relevant for your country. For Oops. So there will be slight variations, nevertheless, and things could go wrong there. But providing the code, if you can convince people to run it, is still the best. <laughs> is that? Hmm. Yeah, I think we're fine. You're going to have to be more than five minutes, right? No. Should, should be okay. Okay, so Dan also asked me to talk a little bit about what happens after the meta-analysis and how you get independent uh, SNPs, independent hits from your results. So you run the meta-analysis and you have a bunch of genome-wide significant SNPs. Are these all independent signals? Of course not, because of LD. And how do you go from these genome-wide significant SNPs to, to independent loci?
There are a couple of, of ways to do it. The first one, the most popular one, is the is clumping. So you, the algorithm for doing that is basically you take the SNP with the lowest p-value, <coughs> then uh, this is your lead SNP, then you uh, specify a window around that SNP. It could be 500 kilobases, one megabase. We usually look at the whole chromosome. Uh, and you specify a, a, an R-square uh, threshold. Then, uh, within that window, if a SNP has uh, a correlation with your lead SNP for more, more than uh, that R-square threshold, we use 0.1. Uh, you assign that SNP to that locus, and the locus is represented by your lead SNP. So you do that uh, for the first locus, and then uh, you look at the remaining SNP, SNPs. You get the uh, most significant SNP from there. You do the same thing until no uh, genome-wide significant SNPs remain. So some people, yeah, I mean there are ways, different ways to do this. Um, in the schizophrenia paper, for example, if I remember correctly, after doing this, they also merged the, the loci that are in very close proximity. Um, you can uh, look at a window of one megabase, or you can look at the whole chromosome, for example. Uh, so there is no strict definition of a locus or how you define uh, independent SNPs. Yeah, this is uh, an R-square threshold of 0.1, and looking at the whole chromosome, for example, um, is a conservative way to do it. And there's another different way you can do it, which is conditional and joint multiple SNP analysis, or COJO. Yeah. Oh, you, you need a reference sample, of course, sorry. So you first need to have a reference sample whose LD structure is representative of your discovery sample LD structure. So you use, for example, a th thousand genomes European sample. You estimate the LD between SNPs using that sample. And uh, so, yeah, so y you estimate the correlations using that. Yeah. So this method also requires a reference sample uh, that is representative of your discovery uh, sample. Wait, what are your, the reference samples you use? Because are there wonderful reference samples that are somehow unusable for genes directly because they're missing the phenotype? Or yes. Yeah. Like the um, genomes. Yeah. That's like the q and they, 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 they just gathered high quality genetic data on a small group of people, but they've measured every base pair. And, um, and they've labeled it by, you know, the, what they believe the ancestor group to be. And so they've only... Oh, oh, so you can get good power on LD from small samples that are fully sequenced? Mm, good yeah. Enough. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the larger the better, of course. But you but could use, like, something like, if, if, if you're doing work in UKB, maybe it'd be better to use the whole UKB as your reference sample, but... But then it will be... British, of course, the LD structure yeah, yeah. will so be represent. Yeah. Yes, but if you're doing your analysis in a British yeah. sample... Yeah, exactly. So, so Miles, there are two issues. Like, so to, to, to just get a precise estimate of the pairwise correlation between two SNPs in your reference sample, 2,000 people is more than enough, right? That estimate's going to have a small standard error. But then, as I just said, um, the concern is that your estimate might not, that the correlation in your reference sample might not be representative of the correlation structure in your discovery, in your sample. In your discovery sample. And, and that's always going to be true to some extent, but I think we know less about exactly how much, how, you know, how concerned one should be about subtle LD differences. Uh, one way that people are trying to solve that problem these days is um, actually have cohorts upload some information about the LD in their cohort and then sort of create a, yeah. Yeah. So y this uh, is implemented in GCTA and this also requires a reference sample. Uh, so what you do here is, using the summary statistics from the meta-analysis, you take the lowest p-value SNP from, uh, from the list of SNPs that you want to do this for. Um, you estimate the conditional effects and the p-values um, of all remaining SNPs in the list, using the LD structure from your reference sample again. And you 
drop the SNP with the greatest p-value, then you again estimate the conditional effects and p-values of the remaining SNPs, and then you again drop the SNP with the largest p-value until no genome-wide significant SNPs remain. So this is nice in the sense that, well, it's, I mean, you can actually estimate the conditional effects, the effect sizes of, this, of those SNPs. <laughs> But the downside is that this is very sensitive to the LD reference sample that you're using. So if, it's, if there are differences between your, the LD, in your LD structure in your reference sample and your discovery sample, uh, it, could lead to, uh, it could lead to weird results, as we have seen once, I think. Yeah. So, so just to be clear about what's going on here, this is, this is a way to approximate what you would get from running a multivariate regression where you're controlling for the correlated SNPs, given that you don't actually, you, you don't have access to the individual level data. So you're taking the meta-analysis uh, beta coefficients, um, and, and essentially what you want is like this, you know, what you would want in the, if you could run the regression would be X prime X, which is the, where X is the genotype. We want X prime X inverse X prime Y. You use, the reference sample to get your estimate of x prime x, so the correlations in the, 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 the variance covariance matrix of the genotypes, and then you use your summary statistic for the x prime y part, and you use that to construct what you would have gotten from a multivariate regression. So, uh, so are you basically saying if you have the individual data, you, you'd be okay just running uh, OLS uh, on, or you know, in, rather than using this? LD correction? Yeah, if you have individual level data, there's no need for this, right? Mm -hmm. But if you don't, then, then the point of this is that you can still back out coefficient estimates from, the, from a multivariate regression, assuming you know the covariance between the two SNPs you're interested in, okay. and that you get from the reference sample. So the reference sample is just to have individual data to get the covariance yeah. structure. Yes. If yeah. you actually have the individual data, you can always get the covariance structure from the sample you're in, assuming I mean, the sizes you're going to need anyway are going to be plenty big to get the covariance structure. That's right. Yeah. You can also do both. I mean, you can uh, do the clumping. And after the clumping, if, you, if there are two SNPs that you're suspicious of, for example, if they are close together but still one SNP is outside the uh, LD window that you specified, and if, if uh, they seem to be the is a similar signal, for example, if they are in, in the same gene, or if, if you have any reason to be suspicious after clumping, uh, you can do COJO with those two SNPs and see whether the effect of one SNP disappears uh, after controlling for the other SNPs. And you may, uh, and applying this method, you may also find that within some locus, the way you defined it, you have multiple signals that are independent. So yeah. Maybe yeah, so if, if you do that. clumping with an R square threshold of 0.1, for example, that is very conservative. You're saying that two SNPs that are correlated with an R square of 0.1 are the same signal. So Kojo, with Kojo, you could also see whether those are actually independent signals from the same gene, for example, or not. Yeah, uh, when, yeah, when you just have three GWAS hits, you're not too concerned about that. But, uh, mm -hmm. but when you start hitting, you know, when you're in the hundreds, um, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, so for height, for example, they, they're starting to find a bunch of low with multiple independent associations. And there, there's every reason to think that there'll be some cases like that also for other traits. All right, so let's, um, let's, let's take a break here for 10 minutes. And then at um, five after six, um, we'll continue with the um, discussion of problem set two. We'll just go until until six thirty, like on the schedule. Um, and, uh, and as before, you know, we're think about we'll do questions that are about problem set two first, and then open it to to any questions. Hello. Oh, can I ask a quick question about um, earlier in the introduction? You mentioned mm -hmm. that. 
no. Yeah, you have if you, if you have the alleles, for example, you would uh, know whether it's an indel or not because it would be the alleles would be coded I or D, for example. I mean, you don't have to actually uh, have a variable in there that specifies what the variant is. Uh, you can figure that out uh, using a again a reference data that specifies which SNP ID is what kind of variant. Or you but can also understand it from the alleles that are specified. Yeah. It, it, it might be that the QC procedures for different types of variants would be different, though. So, like the, the, yeah. the QC you want to do on SNPs might be different than inversions or indels or some of these other things that we've talked about, right? Yes. Yes. So you want to analyze. You, you may want to analyze those separately. And if you if you, you don't have to drop them necessarily because, and you can drop them after the meta analysis. But yeah, you would want to see how many of your variants are in those, for example, so. Yes. Yes. It depends on your p-values. So you take the lead SNP, which has the lowest p-value. I don't think there is a strict definition of a locus. So people mean different things by, I think it just means a location on a chromosome, yeah. basically. So it depends on the context. Yeah. 